copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. Los Angeles Police calling all cars, attention all cars, broadcast 116. Be on the lookout for Eddie Griffith. Described as American, age 23, height 5 feet 10 and 1 half inches, weight 148 pounds, has definite hair, brown eyes. This man is wanted for robbery. Step on it, boy. Rose and close. Announcer Rosenquist radios to a patrol car, step on it, boys. The car, which has been cruising so slowly, leaps suddenly into action. Rio Grande cracked gasoline is sprayed into each cylinder. And because it is so finely cracked, it burns instantly, creating acceleration and power that sends the police car roaring to the rescue. Los Angeles police say no other gasoline gives such acceleration and power as Rio Grande cracked. That's why all Los Angeles City fire engines, radio cars, ambulances, motorcycles, have used nothing but Rio Grande cracked gasoline for three successive years. The patented, exclusive cracking process gives Rio Grande decided advantages over all other gasoline. Police in other cities have also found that Rio Grande cracks test faster, more powerful than others. So in Oakland, Berkeley, and in Maricopa County, Arizona, in all the West, Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline powers more police and emergency cars than any other brand. And now we present Chief James E. Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department. Chief Davis. Good evening, friends. I wish to thank the sponsors of this program for their foresight and civic-mindedness in preparing and presenting the program arranged for your entertainment tonight. It serves a dual purpose. It assists the Los Angeles Police Department in presenting to our many thousands of listeners a vivid picture of what the migratory criminal problem really means to police agencies. At the same time, it should serve to make American citizens anxious to preserve their peace and security more conscious of their duty toward the police in cooperating with them and supporting them in their unceasing efforts to protect the lives and property of our people. The killer, whose career of crime will be unfolded for you here this evening, was a typical migratory criminal who entered the state in the parlance of a hobo by riding the rod and hitchhiking. He carried with him a gun which he had used in Seattle to murder a policeman. Although he was but 23 years of age, he came into California without money, without any visible means of support, and obviously with no intention of working or giving to this state any service whatsoever in return for what it might give him. But on the contrary, as our police records show, he sought to forage in green pastures even if he had to rob and kill to do so. He was a typical vicious criminal who called himself Young Billinger and committed burglaries and robberies over the length and breadth of Oregon and California. Tonight's story is a true story of one migratory indigent whose criminal career under a proper fingerprint and border patrol program might have been nipped in the bud. Seattle, Washington. Late on April evening in 1934, a Seattle police sergeant enters his house. Who's there? Take him up. Oh, the baby face. All right, save the cracks and stick up your hands. Uh, listen, you're making a mistake. Ah, do you know right. I know what I'm doing? I know, but My old man put me into this rocket when I was 12 years old. I don't need none of your advice. Now, uh, listen. Boy, think the word of an old police sergeant. Oh, a police sergeant? Yes. Well, in that case... Oh. You'll never identify me. Oh, 
Los Angeles, California, June 16th, 1934, in a coffee shop on West 7th Street, late at night. Hello, buddy. Pretty chilly after night, is Yeah. What'll it be? Cup of hot java? I ain't got time. Pick him up. What? Up, I said. I get back to you in the corner. I want to inspect your cash register. Uh, not doing much business, are you? You got anything in your pocket? No, uh, I haven't. Uh, you're lucky I don't bump you off. I'll fix you, a little rat. Hold you. Hold you. I don't want you. Two W one five one six. Two W one five one six. Detail, Lieutenant Devine speaking. It's for the right way up here. Yeah? What address? 7th and Whitmer. We'll be right out. Come on, Tom. What's up? Robbery at 7th and Whitmer. Searches the mug book for the man he claims had followed his car. 
Finally, he points to the picture of Ben Kennedy. And within three hours, the detectives have Kennedy in custody on a warrant charging robbery and assault with a deadly weapon. Suffering from bad hangover and frightened, he talks willingly. I didn't have nothing to do with it, I tell you. You borrowed Stan's car last night, didn't you? Yeah, but I didn't pull no hold up. That car was used for a getaway in the hold up on 7th Street. You borrowed the car. Now, we're smart enough to put two and two together. I didn't pull no hold up. There were three men in that car. Who were the other two? A couple of friends of mine. But I, I don't know nothing. What were their names? One was Frank. The other was Eddie. Frank and Eddie what? I know their last name. So you and Frank and Eddie went for a ride in Stern's car last night. Yeah. Where did you go? Uh, just rode around. Rode up to 7th and Whitmer, didn't you? We might have. Think carefully. You not only might have, you did. Isn't that the truth? Oh, yeah. We stopped up on 7th Street for a few minutes. What happened up there? Eddie got out and went across the street and went into the eating joint. A couple of minutes later, I heard something that sounded like shooting. And Eddie come running across the street and jumped into the car. He told me to drive like the devil, so what the hell? You say you heard something that sounded like shots. Isn't it a fact that you did hear shots? It's like I just told you. I asked Eddie what the noise was, and he said it was some kids shooting firecrackers. What's Eddie's last name? I don't know. Would you recognize his picture if you saw it? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. Hand me that book of robbery mugs, Jerry. Okay. Thanks. All right, Ben. Start looking. See any pictures on this page that look like him? No. How about these boys? He ain't on this page. Well, look these over. No. Four hours, the two detectives forced the suspect to scrutinize carefully the pictures of criminals in the huge robbery squad mug book. But Ben does not recognize any of them as his friend of the night before. Finally. Well, here's the last page. Is any picture here, Ben? No. Looks like he hasn't got a record. How about it, Ben? Had he ever been in trouble before? Well, I don't know. Think carefully now. It, it seems like he said something about a beef up in Frisco. Up in Frisco? Well, there's something else. Get down that San Francisco mug book, will you, Tom? Sure. Here we are. Uh, See, do I have to look through this one, too? I'm getting hungry. Go get something to eat after you find out his picture. Yeah, but, gee, I want to these easy. boys over. No. He ain't there. How about here? No. Well, there's plenty of pages. Lots of time. See him on this page? Yeah, that's him, I think. This one here? Jack Thomas, alias Jack Newton, alias Eddie Griffith. Is that the guy, Eddie Griffith? Well, if it ain't him, it looks enough like him to be his kid brother. Yeah, probably him, then. That picture was taken three years ago. San Francisco, number 440512. Well, would you look at this mug's record, Tom? Picked up in Seattle when he was only 11 years old for staying out late. Sent to Preston from San Francisco for a stick-up when he was 16. He's a tough guy, all right. He won't be when we get through with him. We don't stand for young bums running around with cats in this town. consequences of his friendship with the young hoodlum with the long record, then leads the officers to an apartment on South Lorendo Street, where he had stayed with Frank and Eddie. But when they arrive, the apartment is unoccupied. The detectives summon the landlord. Yes, gentlemen, what was it you wanted? They're looking for the boys who have this apartment. You know anything about them? No, I don't. I never pry into my tenant's affairs so long as they pay the rent. When were they here last? Well, they weren't here last night, I'm sure. They left yesterday afternoon with a couple of miles. I've seen them drive away in a tan Chrysler. They're yeah, probably stolen. They found. Yes. What's the last one in this desk drawer? What? Scrap of paper. It says straight down Clinton to Larchmont. Turn to left. Larchmont Theater. And here on the back is a map of the theater lobby showing the position of the box office. Does that mean anything to you? Sure. Archmont Theater was robbed in daylight last week. And our friend Eddie Griffiths probably did the job. You know anything about that one, Ben? No. Well, we'll check Eddie's mug to the manager of the theater. Say, do your tenants leave their cars back there in that yard? Uh, a lot of them do. Why? I just wondered. You got a hunch, Tom. Let's look over those cars that are out there. Okay. Uh, there's a real entrance right at the end of the hall. Come on. Let's see if the license plate check with the numbers on the registration slip. 
You got a chance? Yeah, not a bad idea. Well, let's try it anyway. 
Okay, Skipper. Anyway, I've got another lead on that in. Uh, what's that? I've just received a tip that he's strike breaking in San Pedro with Roy Saper, Frank Bonamore, and Lyra Capasa. You know, they're the guys that we want for that bank job last week. I've sent Chambers and Johnson down there to pick them up. We'll wait for their report. Hello there, Chambers. Hello, Bill. How do you like this harbor duty? I don't. This 12 hour shift is killing me. You guys in the detective bureau got it stopped. Yeah, we don't work 12 hours. We work all hours. And your feet on a desk in City Hall. Go on, Bill. You know how easy you guys in uniform have it. I'll trade. What are you doing down here? Looking for a couple of strike breakers that are pretty good at breaking banks. Oh, who are they? I know most of the boys. Well, look at these pictures. And they're probably using phony names. Sure, I know these guys. They're working just down the dock here. All right, come along with us. I think they're unloading the Cooper ship. Yeah, there they are now. Coming down the gangplank. Come on. Uh oh, they've seen us. All right, boys. Stand right where you are. Hey, come back here, you two. They're running up the gangplank. Tackle that last one, Johnson. Maybe these cuts will keep you quiet. Oh, that's a big idea. What do you guys want? Ah, shut up. Take care of them, Bill. Johnson and I are going to search the ship for the other two. But Eddie Griffith once more had eluded the law. He and Bonomo successfully escaped through the ship's bills, and although within a few days the robbery squad picked up Bonomo and Capasso, the other members of the bank robbing trio, and subsequently sent them to San Quentin, Eddie remained at large. A month passes. The constant shadow kept on the two girlfriends of Eddie is relentless but fruitless. Wise to the ways of the underworld, they realize they are being followed. Remain away from Eddie Griffith. Finally, Connor and Divine bring them in once more for such. What's that big idea? You guys had us in here once and we proved to you we was clean. Yeah, and ever since we've had the privacy of a goldfish. I wouldn't be surprised if you birds watched at the windows when we went to bed. Keeping Tom's with badges, that's what you are. Are you all through? Not by several mouthfuls, I ain't. Well, then shut up and I'll tell you what the big idea is. They want Eddie Griffith. Well, go get him. You're going to help us. Oh, no, we ain't. Well, we have good reason to believe that you know where he is. How come? You know what kind of toothpaste we use. You certainly ought to know if we've been hearing from him. We're reasonably certain that you have, miss. Well, we ain't talking, see. Well, that's a relief. Now, listen to me. You girls are in a bad spot. There's a rap waiting for you in Oakland. Maybe before we're through, we'll hang a couple on you down here. If you acted like ladies, it might go easier. You know, I hate to see a couple of kids like you going the wrong way. Why, here you are just at the age when you ought to be having a good time, wearing pretty clothes, thinking of marrying up with some nice guy and raising a family, and look at you. Dressed in dirty slacks, traveling around the country with a couple of stick-up artists. Why, if they were big shots, it wouldn't be so bad. There, a couple of tin horns. You got a mother, Cora? No, she's dead. Oh, that's too bad. I wonder what she's thinking up there if she knows what a jam you're in. Well, I don't know. And how about you, Stella? Does your mother know what you're up to? No. Well, how would you like to have her know about it? No. No. How would you like to have her write your letters and care the woman's prison at the hatchet? No, I don't want her to know. She thinks I got a good job down here in L.A. Well, girl, what about it? Well, listen, we want to do the right thing. I'm sure you do. Look. If we show you where Eddie is, will you let us go? Well, we'll do everything we can for you. Completely swayed by the shrewd psychology of the two officers, the girls lead them to Eddie's hideaway on Bordry Street. But again, the officers arrive too late. Eddie has escaped. And that night, another holdup occurs in which Eddie is described by the victim. And then, two days later, Captain Figger receives a letter from the Seattle Police Department. He sends for Connor and Devine. Boys, I've got a letter here that'll interest you. From the Seattle Department. They say, the Eddie Griffiths referred to in your bulletin is known to us as an incorrigible juvenile. We last heard of him when he was sent to Preston from San Francisco. However, investigation of recent holdups and the murder of Police Sergeant Donovan in April point to this subject as a suspect. Several victims have identified Griffith's picture as man who held them up, and the single witness who saw a man leaving Sergeant Donovan's house after he was murdered feels reasonably sure that Griffith is the man. Please inform us, if you have placed him in custody, that we may begin extradition proceedings and bring him back here for questions. Well, boys, what do you think of that? 
Well, it's like this case is bigger than we thought. So the bum's wanted for murdering an officer, eh? No, we'll never stop until we get him. I was getting a little tired of all this trouble for a stick-up artist. But this changes everything. Oh, pardon me just a moment, please. Captain Seeger speaking. Yes? Yes? Okay, thanks. Well, boys, maybe this is your last day on the case. Well, what do you mean? Things are happening fast. That was a tip that Griffiths is leaving town. He's to meet a pal of his at the corner of 7th and Alvarado at 1 o'clock. And that's just an hour and 15 minutes from now. Call the boys in. Yeah. Into the captain's office, you guys. Now, uh, boys, we're going to pick up Eddie Griffiths at the corner of 7th and Alvarado at 1 o'clock. Oh, that holdup guy. Well, he isn't only a holdup guy. We just learned that he's wanted for the killing of a police officer in Seattle last spring. Now, listen. I want you all to get a good look at his mug here. See? So that you'll recognize it. Here's the plan. Captain Berger, you and your partner will be parked in the car on 7th Street heading west, as close to the corner as you can get. Carter, you and Devine park on Alvarado heading north. Chambers on 7th heading east. Johnson, put on a pair of overalls and hang around the northwest corner by the park. Now, you two men hide in one of the stores on the northeast corner of Alvarado. Use your own car so that you won't cause any suspicion. As soon as you see him, close in on from all sides. I don't want any slip-ups on this. Bring him in dead or alive, but bring him in. Within 15 minutes, the men are staked out. A fine position at the corner of 7th and Alvarado, looking as little like police officers as possible. Traffic streams past the busy corner. Hundreds of people in the noon hour luncheon crowd hurry by, oblivious of the tense group of police. To eagerly scan each passing face, each speaking automobile. Ignorant of the fact that at any moment this intersection may become another battlefield in the war against crime. Finally, after an hour of nerve wracking alertness, divine systems with excitement. There he is. Where? That gray Ford road still turning north into Alvarado. Still at the gun. Now the lights again. Can't help that. Take a chance. Car chambers. Take him down, Johnson. Hey, what is it? You're under arrest for robbery and murder. Huh? Clap the cuffs on him, Cap. Get a 38 in his pants and a 45 in the left hand pocket of the car. Into the car, you. What's your name, buddy? My name? Young Dillinger. Yeah? Well, my name's Young Melvin Purvis. Let's go, Connor. Believe me, it certainly takes a lot of them detectives to arrest one young kid.
Los police calling all cars, attention all cars, cancellation broadcast 116 regarding Eddie Griffiths and the robbery. This case is now closed. That's all. Rolls and This is Federick Lindsley bidding you good night.